Well, good morning, Evangel Church. Morning, my name's Bobby Nemeth, and I have the privilege of serving as your teaching and discipleship pastor. Just such an awesome day today that we get to celebrate the Lord and we get to lean in and listen to God's word. Wanna also welcome those of you in Woodbridge joining us. We're so grateful that you can be with us here today as well. And those of you online, so grateful that you can just spend this time leaning in, listening and learning from God's word together. Over the past few weeks, we've been on a journey together. And what we've been doing is we've been walking through the book of Revelation, specifically the messages that Jesus has for the seven churches that are in Asia Minor. I think they have a, um, a map where you could see all those churches laid out. And here's the thing, church, we've only got two more left. We got today, Philadelphia, and then next week, Laodicea. And so I hope that you've been enjoying it and I hope that you've been leaning in and listening because it's been exciting each week as we work through these messages and how Jesus is trying to speak to these churches to reorient their focus, to readjust their gaze and get them to lean in and listen to what he has to say to them because it's so easy to get distracted by the things of the world. I, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the world and it's incredibly easy for us to just get our focus on all of that, the pressures to lose our direction and then get lost in the dark. But church, here's what we're called to do. We are called to set our focus on Jesus. And, and, and through setting our focus on him, I promise you that we are going to be able to overcome every obstacle and every situation, every circumstance that comes our way. So in my life, uh, you know, I've had personal obstacles and I've had not so, uh, well, not that they're not personal, but, but like real, I've had really big obstacles in my life and then I've had not so big obstacles. I want to tell you a story about one of the not so big obstacles. So one year for our anniversary, Christina and I went to Connecticut, and she, being the adventurous one, had this bright idea that we could take a little trip over to Rhode Island and go to this lovely town called Newport, and we can go check it out. And so I was like, why not? Let's go hop in the car. And I don't know. It was like an hour, hour and a half away. Um, and, and so we went, and we saw all the sights and visited all the things there, and then there was this walk that's there. It's called the Cliff Walk. Anybody ever heard of the cliff walk in Newport? All right, so there's a few people who love the cliff walk in Newport. All right, so it's fabulous. It's basically a walk along the coast, but it's not just kind of any walk that you take. You see, some parts are paved like you see here on the, uh, on the screen, but then there are other parts that are not so paved. And what, what you'll see is at times you're actually walking across boulders. And so this past year, this is, that's Christina with Elizabeth and that's my brother-in-law, Daniel. And, they're, and we're walking along and navigating these paths. So it's not always as clearly marked out for you as you would like. And when we first did this in, uh, I think it was about 2016 or so, 2015, somewhere in there, uh, we didn't know the difficulty when we set out on it. We didn't know how long it was going to be when we started, but here's my recollection of it. And, and you can ask Christina uh, if you wanna verify any of this. So as we began our stroll that afternoon, we admired the scenery and we started along this wonderful path, but soon the terrain became more difficult and the sun was slowly setting because our anniversary is in October, and so the sun tends to set a little bit earlier. And it was only getting darker, and we didn't have any clue about how far away we were from the end. And oh, I forgot to mention, her phone was dead, and mine had like 2% battery left in it. So, and we don't even know where we're going to get off and where our car is parked in relationship to where we're getting off. We have no clue. So, spoiler alert, we made it back in one piece because we're here. However, this cautious individual was more than a little stressed as we were navigating this unfamiliar path with his adventurous wife. So here's the thing. The sun's setting. We're on this hike, and we have a decision to make. Stay on the path as it's getting dark, as, as the sun's already set, and now we're in twilight. We don't know what's ahead of us. Or go back and hope that our familiarity to navigate what we already crossed is going to be able to get us out. Because here's the problem with this hike. When you're on it, you can't just hop off sideways. You've either got to go forward or you've got to go backwards. There's no sideways here. Otherwise, you'd have to like hop a fence and go in somebody's yard. I don't think they would like that. 
So here's the thing. We pressed on in the path, and the deeper we went, the darker it got. The deeper we went, the darker it got. Finally, in what seemed like forever, we found a spot where we could get off onto a road and figure out where in the world we were and where we parked our car. Needless to say, it was an incredible test for our marriage on an anniversary weekend for communication skills. Here's the thing. Have you ever been on a path where you found yourself lost? Where you got stuck in a situation and you weren't sure if you were even going the right way? Maybe you feel like every door just closed on you. The path before you is barely illuminated. Maybe it's a relationship with a friend. You used to be close, but now you don't even talk. Maybe you got a diagnosis and there's no answers. The doctors don't even know what to do anymore. How do you navigate through these tough times? Today, as we look at the sixth letter to the churches in Revelation, I believe that Jesus is going to help us to navigate these moments and overcome these obstacles. So today, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to open up to the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter three. You can tap over there on your devices, the book of Revelation, or you could just follow along on the screen if you'd like as we read the letter to Philadelphia. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David, and what he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I, I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Y you have a little strength, yet you've obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. And they will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it and I will write on them the name of my God and they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God and I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Lord, today we need ears to hear, we need eyes to see, and open hearts to receive what you might say to us through your word, through this message to this church. God, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The origin story of Philadelphia is actually kind of cool. So here's what happened. Philadelphia was founded by two brothers, and it was in the second century BC. Scholars debate on which one of them founded the city, but here's what happened. We know the city gained its name because the Romans tried to tell one of the brothers to betray the other brother. And when the brother said, no, I will not betray my brother, he was named Philadelphus which just basically means the one who loves his brother. And so the city reflects the name of the love between these two brothers. So a, a rather young city for the region, Philadelphia was well positioned along trade routes in Asia Minor. And so it was seen as the doorway to Asia abroad and essentially it made them a great access point beyond the Roman Empire. However, as great of an access point as it was, the ground beneath Philadelphia was quite shaky. It was not sure. And multiple times through the first century, Philadelphia was struck by earthquakes. In particular, there was one earthquake in AD 17 called by uh, one historian at the time as the greatest earthquake in human memory, and it demolished the city. So the Roman Empire knew the damage, and what they did was they helped them and many other cities in the region rebuild by grant, not only granting them money, but also said, you don't have to pay taxes for five years. Could you imagine if the government was like, hey, you had a travesty, no taxes for five years. 
That'd be kind of awesome. So in honor of this gift from Caesar, they actually renamed their, their city Neo Caesarea, which is just like the new Caesar. So by the second century, their devotion to Rome blossomed into being a fully committed uh, place to the emperor cult. So inscribed on their coins, and you can see on the picture of the coin here, the title Neocoros, which basically means that they are the temple caretakers or the temple sweeps. Because like many other cities in Asia Minor, the prestige that came with devoting themselves to, the, to, to Rome and the cult of worship, it was too great to pass up. They were like, we've got to honor them for everything they've done for us. What's also interesting in Philadelphia is they have a really strong Jewish presence there. You may remember when I preached last month uh, regarding the church in Smyrna that they were also dealing with these interesting twin pressures. There was, on one hand, you have the pressures coming from the Romans, but then there's also these interesting pressures that are coming from the Jewish community there. And so what I want to do is I want to explore these twin pressures that are pressing in on the Philadelphia church. So the reasons for these tensions between the Jews and And the Christians stem from the fact that originally Christianity was just a sect inside of Judaism. And so to an outsider, they were just like, oh, they're just Jews. They just do things a little bit differently. No big deal. But there was a key difference. And the Jews picked up on this difference. Christians elevated Jesus and they worshipped him alongside of Yahweh. So for the Jews, this was a big no-no. Why? Because there is only one God. And so you can't have two gods. So how are you going to worship Jesus and God? Like, that doesn't work out for us. Furthermore, Christians call Jesus the Messiah, which which, uh, we translate as Christ, which is like calling him king or lord. And for the Romans, this was a big no-no. You see, because there was only one king, and he was ruling in Rome, in fact, the emperor was actually a quasi-divine figure, and they gave him the title of the Son of God, or they called him Lord. And so Christians are caught in this tension of worship. Over time, Philadelphia, as they decided to show devotion to Rome by joining the emperor cult, they practiced in practicing the worship of the Caesars. This caused complications for the Christians. You see, originally for the Christians, this isn't an issue because if they were seen as just a sect of Judaism, they wouldn't have to worship Caesar. They would be, um, they would be exempt from such requirements. And so Jews were considered to practice an ancient religion. And so the Romans are like, yeah, we're fine with ancient religions, but if you want to worship a new God, well, then you can worship Caesar right along with him. And so the conflict begins to deepen between the Jews and the Christians throughout the first century. Jews began to separate from Christians, and they were like, listen, you guys don't worship the same God that we do because you're worshiping Jesus, and so what we're going to do is we're going to remove you out, and that exposes them to the pressure from the, Rome, from the Romans to want to worship Caesar, and by the end of the first century, the Jews who had these set prayers that they would pray every single day added to their prayers a prayer for the apostates, and this is their prayer that they would pray. The apostates in this case are the Christians. For the apostates, that is those who reject the true faith, let there be no hope. And uproot the kingdom of arrogance speedily in our days. May the Nazarenes, that's the followers of Jesus, because remember he's Jesus of Nazareth, and the sectarians, those who branched off, perish as in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be written together with the righteous. You are praised, O Lord, who subdues the arrogant. So the Jews early on, they were quite hostile to the Christians because they believed that we abandoned the faith that was handed down from Abraham and Moses. That we were rejecting it all for a false prophet named Jesus. The Jews had essentially closed the doors of the synagogue to the Christians and left them out in the dark, isolated and exposed in this city. And so the question becomes for these followers of Christ, What were they to do? Worship Caesar? Reject Jesus? Go back to Judaism? Stay faithful to Christ and face persecution? What were they to do? In the city of brotherly love, 
These early Christians weren't feeling any of the love, and they were probably feeling all alone, probably feeling scared, probably feeling exposed. You see, there are decisions, there are moments in our life when we can just feel isolated and where our commitment to Christ may cause us to feel cut off could cause us to feel separated from society. And it's in moments like this that Jesus comes to his people to give them words to encourage them because in our darkest moments, here's what I want to tell you, Jesus is not far from us. Jesus is not separated from us. Jesus has not abandoned us. Why? Because he's the God who said that he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. And in the midst of that pain, Jesus comes to his people, and this is what he says. I am the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. And what I open, no one can close. And what I close, no one can open. Despite the opposition that the church was facing from the culture, from their former religious allies, followers of Jesus in Philadelphia chose to remain steadfast. You see, in this dark moment, they said, no, we're going to allow our light to shine rather than just put a cover over our lamp. We're going to let it burn brightly rather than snuff it out because of the pressures that we're facing. Why? Because in those moments, Jesus says, listen, when you feel like every door is locked, when you feel like there's no way out, Jesus comes and says, I've got the keys. Don't worry, I am the one who has the keys. And and I'm sure you've been there. I'm sure you've been there. You know, Christina and I, we've certainly experienced this before. You're out all day, you're running errands, and you've got the kids, and you've got all the stuff, and it's late, and it's dark, and you're like, I don't want to make multiple trips back to the car, so what do you do? You grab the kids, you grab all the stuff, and you go bring it up to the door, and then both of you have your arms full with stuff, and then you're like, who's got the keys? Please tell me that you have the keys, because I have all this stuff, and I don't want to put it down and go run back, right? Relief only comes when when the other person says, I do. I've got the keys. See, it matters who has the keys because they hold the power to determine who's on the inside and who's on the outside. And Jesus was looking at this church that was feeling locked out, that feels like they lost all access, and he comes to them and he says, I've got the keys. I've got all the keys. And if you feel like the door is stuck, if you feel like it's locked, don't worry. I've opened a door for you that no one can close. You see, Jesus wants the church to know that whatever doors they think are being closed, they don't matter. Why? Because he has the keys to the doors that matter, the doors that will give us access to the greatest things, the promise of access to his presence in eternity. I mean, just look at the promise that he offers them, a place with him in the new Jerusalem. Because here's the thing, our hope should be shaped towards eternity. And what is that? what does that look like? We'll read through the book of Revelation. And he even alludes to it here in this letter to them. The final picture is us dwelling and living with God forever in the new Jerusalem, in the new creation. That's the hope of Christianity. And it's in, as Paul says, in this hope you were saved. From the first moment, we see Jesus back in chapter one. Here's what we see him. We see him holding keys. Jesus says, I now have the keys of death and Hades. You see, Jesus is the one who died and rose again so that he might defeat the powers that held us in bondage since the very beginning, the powers of sin and the powers of death. Like, here's what the author of Hebrews reminds us of. Because God's children are human beings, because we're made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Today, Jesus wants to set us free. He wants to open a door to liberate us, to help us to walk in the freedom that he purchased for us. Jesus breaks the power of fear. He breaks the power of slavery. 
and he breaks the chains that bind us. And what he ultimately does is he brings us into a family. Because when he rose, he didn't just take himself up out of the grave. No, he took over authority over the place and the power of death so that you and I no longer have to fear. They no longer have any authority. So in Christ, they have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Why? Because he has overcome. So for a church that's being denied access, Jesus tells them, I've got the keys. And it doesn't matter what doors the world is closing because the only doors that matter are the ones that he is opening. You see, Jesus has a way to get you through, to get you to where you need to go and to make a way where there seems to be no way. And what we have to do is we have to stop getting focused on all the wrong doors that are closed. We have to stop getting focused on all the doors that are being shut, that we're like, oh, well, why are they shutting this door? And why are they shutting this door? And why are they shutting this door? And what we need to do is come to the one who has the keys and say, Lord, which door are you opening? Because that's the only door that I ever want to walk through. Because when we get focused on the keys of the world, then we're going to miss the door that Jesus wants to open for us. You see, to a church that's left out in the darkness, standing on the word of God, the promise of an open door is everything that they needed to hear because that promise will give them hope to stand on. It will give them the ability to press forward and persevere through every obstacle. And when the one holds the keys shows up, he doesn't just come in the door. No, what he does is he comes and he sheds light in that very dark place. Why? Because he is the light. Remember what Jesus says in John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you won't have to walk in the darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. No matter how dark our situation is, remember that he holds the keys. And when he opens the door, his light invades the situation with his presence because he is the light of the world. The light is here now and it has the power to drive back the darkness and illuminate our path before us. And now we don't have to walk in darkness anymore because he is with us. John in the beginning of his gospel reminds us the word that is Jesus gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to every one. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never ever, ever extinguish it. It's, it's so easy in a community where your access is being denied, where, when you feel locked out and lost, to allow your light to grow dim, to allow your love to grow cold. It's so easy to get trapped in that depression and that vulnerability. And really what we just need to do is we need to come back to Jesus because What happens is in those moments, that's when he comes to us and he says, listen, I know all the things you do and that you have little strength. Why? Because they've been persevering, because they've been pressing forward with all this opposition. And he says, listen, but yet in the midst of this, you obeyed my word and did not deny me. That's what we want said of us, despite all the doors being closed, that you've obeyed, that you've kept the faith, that you persevered and that you pressed forward. That's what we are called to do. Despite the persecution we're facing, despite the lack of access, the church chose to acknowledge Jesus, to stand firm on the gospel. And Jesus will even go on to commend them in verse 10 for persevering rather than shrinking back. So now remember, there are only two churches who are commended for their faithfulness in the midst of persecution. And this church has realized that as followers of Christ, we are called to another way. You and I are called to another way because as Peter reminds us, you are a chosen people, right? You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. You see, we're not called to walk in the darkness of the world, rather we're called to walk in the light of his presence as he's in the light. And the church that has embodied the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount does that. Because what's Jesus say? You are the light of the world. And how do you become the light of the world? When you walk with the light of the world. And so what we're called to do is be the light as we walk with the light. And so church, we have a role in the world to be salt and to be light, not sugar and shade. 
See, I'm afraid that sometimes we grow too comfortable and we don't allow our witness to lead the way. And I think sometimes we just settle to try and make everyone happy and appease them like giving candy to a kid. But here's the thing, we're called to something different. You and I are called to be salt and to be light in this world. And so the reason Jesus tells them that he's opening a door for them is because they did not deny him. Because they kept the faith and obeyed the gospel. And despite where that points us in the eyes of the world, our role is to be faithful followers of Christ who walk in the light. We're called to bring hope to this lost and dying world. And Jesus says we do this through our witness and we do this through our works. And you see, when you're in a dark place, think about this. It only takes a little light to illuminate the whole thing. In dark places, you just need the smallest light to be able to see where God is calling you. And now as a parent, I understand the power of light more than ever See, we have a child who still sleeps in the room with us, and she goes to bed before we do. And if I open that door and there's light behind me, she might wake up. And, and, and if there's a lot of noise in the background, she might actually hear that noise. You see, what the door does when it's locked is it blocks all of that light that's coming from the other side, and then when it's opened, all the light fills that space. And then here's the prayer. My prayer is in those moments that she won't be disturbed when, when we walk in the room and wake up because I want her to keep sleeping. You see, what we realize immediately is that light has the power to expose, it has the power to reveal, it has the power to illuminate, and that is what you and I are called to do. This is what Jesus says about his ministry. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light. Why? Because their actions were evil. Let me invite the worship team back up as we get ready to close. Jesus says that because of their life and their actions, that he is going to acknowledge them as the ones that he loves. Jesus looks at this people and says that they are his. And, and today, here's what I want to tell you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what obstacles you're facing, no matter what trials are, are you're going through, these things do not define you. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation and your identity is in him. And then what you need to be focusing on is not the doors of the world, but the door that Christ wants to open before you. And so what this church has done is they have chosen to persevere. They've chosen not to focus on the doors that are closed because they've allowed their good deeds to declare that they are his followers. And not only does he say that he's going to open a door for them, what else does he say that he's going to do? That he is going to place a crown on them, that he's going to reward them in the end. You see, Jesus rewards his followers for their perseverance. And the only requirement in the end that we're called to do is don't divert. Don't get dismayed, don't lose hope, don't lose heart, but continue to persevere with Jesus and then he's going to reward you in the end. In fact, if they hold on, not only will they get a crown of victory, but what they will get in the end for the ones who win, for the ones who overcome, is that they are going to have access to his presence in eternity. They're going to have access to his presence in eternity. Remember this, church, they felt completely shut out. They felt completely isolated. They felt all alone, like nobody was with them. And Jesus wants to say, listen, if you persevere, if you overcome, then here's what's going to happen. I am going to make you pillars in the temple of my God. I'm going to make you a part of the unshakable, undestroyable presence in eternity. Philadelphia may have been shaken by earthquakes. In fact, historians said that there were always cracks in the wall of Philadelphia because the ground under them was always shaking. But here, this church was willing to stand in the midst of trials. They were willing to stand in the midst of persecution. They were willing to allow their light to shine. And because of that, Jesus says, I'm gonna establish you as a foundational piece in my presence as pillars in my temple. Now, now, here's the thing. There's not an actual temple in the New Jerusalem, which is interesting. You see, the, 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 the temple in eternity is, is figurative because here's what Revelation 21 says. I, I saw no temple in the city. 
for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no, de- no need or, or, or of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. And see, see, here's the thing. God says, because your hearts are shaped for eternity, because you're a people focused on my presence and and you're persevering through every obstacle, through every trial, through every situation, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna place you in a foundational place in my presence for all of eternity. Because you put your priority on Jesus, you are gonna get priority in in eternity. You see, they're not gonna be put outside. They're gonna be at the center. And God was going to place his mark on them as he says he's gonna write his name on every single forehead of each of them. To those who endure, to those who overcome, Jesus promises them that they will have a place in the new Jerusalem. And this is the final picture that John paints, Revelation 22, 3 and uh, 5, I think it is. Um, He says, no longer will there be any curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Church, if we're willing to walk in the light now, we won't have to worry about our access in eternity. We won't have to worry about being put out in the dark because we know how the story ends. That we, if we walk with him now, through every obstacle, through every trial, through every tribulation, that we will walk with him in the light in the end. Let's stand as we get ready to close. Church, if you're feeling isolated right now, if you're feeling alone, then here's the risk that I want you to take in this moment, I wanna invite you just to lift up your hands right now and ask Jesus to come and meet you in in this dark place. Maybe you're dealing with depression, maybe you have doubts, maybe dark thoughts. Today, I believe that in that darkness, Jesus wants to open a door to you, to his presence, and that he wants to meet you there. If that's you, as we get ready to sing this closing song, I want you just to lift up your hands and then ask Jesus to come and meet you. Why? Because he is the light of the world and he doesn't want to leave you in in, in that place. And so I want to give you the opportunity to respond. And for others, maybe you feel like you're stuck. Maybe you feel like every single door has been closed and you've been trying to walk faithfully on this path and you're just like, this door is closed and this door is closed. Today, I want you to get focused on Jesus. Today, I want you to say, I'm not going to look at the doors anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Jesus. And then what I want to invite you to do is just come to these altars. Our prayer workers are going to be up here in the front. And then they're going to just come alongside of you and pray with you that you would have your focus on Jesus, that he's going to meet you here in this time, in this place. And so whether you're whether you're dealing in a dark place and just going to worship through that, or whether you need to seek his face because you feel like every door is closed, I just want to invite you into this moment. Let's pray as we close and respond with this final song. Lord, we're so grateful for these moments that we get to press in, that we get to lead in, that we get to seek your face because God, you're trying to do a work in us. And Lord, I don't wanna seek after the doors anymore of the world, but what I wanna do is I wanna see the door that you're opening. So help me to take my eyes off of these doors and help me to focus on the door that you're opening. Help me to seek your face because you're the light of the world and I wanna walk in the light as you're in the light. So give me the ability to persevere. Give me the ability to press forward no matter what it is, no matter what it takes, no matter what's going on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.